All right, so you ready to dive into some uh, business news that has some like huge GE implications for geopolitics? Sure, always. It seems like it's just another tech headline, but trust me, this has some serious global implications. We're talking about the U.S. Justice Department going after Google again. Oh, yeah, I saw that one. But this time, it's different. They're demanding Google sell off its Chrome browser. Whoa. Yeah, the one you're probably using to listen to this right now. Wow, that is different. That's a big deal. This isn't just about tech, is it? This case could actually reshape the entire internet. Exactly. And to get everyone up to speed, the DOJ already scored a win back in August. A federal judge ruled that Google was, like, illegally maintaining its online search monopoly. Right. And Google's appealing. But those legal battles can drag on forever. Oh, yeah, for sure. What makes this August ruling so important? So this August ruling is a huge deal. It's one of the biggest antitrust decisions in decades. Yeah, it's being compared to the brink up of AT&T. And this isn't just a slap on the wrist. It's a clear signal that the DOJ is really serious about tackling big tech's power. Wow, AT&T got broken up. Exactly. And it looks like the DOJ is following a similar playbook here, going after different parts of Google's like empire piece by piece. So they're going after Google step by step. Huh. Okay, let's talk about Chrome. Why is the Justice Department so focused on the Chrome browser? So their main argument is that Google's control over Chrome on top of their Android operating system gives them a huge advantage and it basically kills any competition. They're saying it blocks other companies from getting a fair shot. So it's like using their power in one area to control like other parts of the internet. Exactly. The DOJ is saying that this is a threat to, you know, open markets and it could create even more monopolies later on. And it goes beyond just Chrome. They're also going after those deals that Google has with Apple, the ones that make Google the default search engine on pretty much every iPhone. Right. OK. It sounds like the DOJ is trying to level the playing field. Why should our listeners care about all of this? Because this isn't just about Google. It's about the future of the internet as we know it. The outcome of this case will impact how we get information online, connect with each other, and even how businesses all over the world operate. So this isn't just an American problem. Not at all. This case could change how other countries deal with these tech giants. Governments and companies around the world are watching this case really closely. If the U.S. comes down hard on Google, we could see a ton of antitrust lawsuits against other big tech companies. So this could change how the entire tech industry works, not just in the U.S., but globally. Absolutely. And there's another layer to all of this, and it's a little more unsettling. National security. National security. What does a web browser have to do with national security? Well, there are concerns that if Chrome gets separated from Google, certain code and data related to uh, activities within the browser could be exposed. And this could reveal some pretty sensitive information. It's a reminder that our online world is way more connected to national security than we think. I need you to unpack that a little bit. What kind of activities are we talking about here? Well, there are concerns that foreign governments could be using platforms like Chrome for their own agendas. You know, things like spying or spreading false information. Okay, now that sounds like something out of a spy movie. Yeah, it might sound crazy, but remember the Saltwinds hack? Uh, no, I don't. So the U.S. Senate actually called it the most serious telecommunications hack in U.S. history. Oh, wow. Yeah, it exposed just how vulnerable our networks are, and it showed how foreign actors can mess with our digital infrastructure. So you're saying that foreign governments could be using Chrome to spy on people or spread misinformation? It's definitely a possibility we can't ignore. And this case is forcing us to face those concerns head on. OK, this is intense. We've got potential monopolies, national security risks. This feels so much bigger than just a fight between a tech company and the government. What's the bigger picture here? It boils down to this. How much power should these tech giants actually have? And how do we balance all this innovation with protecting national security and individual rights at the same time? It's like encouraging progress, but making sure no one company becomes too powerful. Exactly. And that is the big question at the heart of this case. It's a battle with huge implications for all of us. What stands out to you the most so far? You know, it's the size of this whole thing. We're talking about a web browser, but this case is about Antitrust law, national security, the future of the internet, it's wild. And we're just scratching the surface. There's a lot more to uncover here, and I'm looking forward to diving deeper with you. I'm with you. This deep dive is just getting started, and I have a feeling things are going to get even more interesting. Me too. So let's um, shift gears a bit. Let's dig into the specifics of what Google's actually being accused of. 
What are these accusations of illegal monopolization about? Is it really illegal for a company to just like be good at what they do? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, because Google's argument is that they just have a great product that people actually want to use. Right. Where's the line between success and, you know, illegal monopolization? That's the million dollar question. Success, innovation, that's not illegal in itself. Right. The problem is when a company uses its size and its market dominance to basically block competition and that hurts consumers or just the market in general. Mm -hmm. It's not about having a good product anymore. It's about making sure that nobody else can even compete. So it's not just about being big. It's about how you use that bigness. Yeah. What are some examples of what Google did that crossed the line? One of the big accusations is something called exclusionary conduct. This is where Google supposedly used its power to just, you know, block competitors from getting a foothold in the search market. For example, they're accused of making these deals with phone companies to make sure that Google was the default search engine on Android phones. That basically makes it impossible for other search engines to reach people, even if they have a better product. So even if there was a better search engine out there, people would just stick with whatever's already on their phone. Exactly. It just creates a cycle where Google stays on top and nobody else can break through. So it's not like one bad thing they did. It's a whole strategy designed to shut out the competition. The DOJ is saying that Google made it so nobody else could win. Exactly. They're saying that Google's actions basically rigged the system and stopped innovation and limited what consumers could choose from. Their argument is that because of Google, the market doesn't work the way it should. Okay, but what about Google's argument that they're just giving people what they want? Yeah. That they don't force anyone to use their stuff. Is there something wrong with having a product that everybody likes? It's a classic defense for companies facing this kind of scrutiny. And, you know, they have a point. People do love Google products, but antitrust law recognizes that even if you're not, like, forcing people, you can still use your power to manipulate them. And in the long run, that's not good for anyone. It's a very subtle but effective form of control. So it's about recognizing the hidden ways that a powerful company can control things, even if it's not as obvious as, you know, forcing people to do something. This is complicated. It is. It's about figuring out where a normal business strategy ends and uh, an abuse of power begins. How do you draw that line? Yeah. How do you even begin to define that line? Well, antitrust law is all about defining those lines, weighing those different interests. You have to balance the good things about innovation with the need to keep competition alive and prevent monopolies. It's a process that constantly needs to adapt, especially as technology and markets change. So it's not black and white. There are good arguments on both sides. This is a lot to unpack. Definitely. But we have to remember, this isn't some abstract legal debate. This will have real world effects on people, businesses, the whole economy. What are you most curious about as this case moves forward? Well, I keep thinking about what could actually happen. What's the best case scenario for Google mm -hmm. and what's the worst? The best case for Google is that they win their appeal and the August ruling gets overturned. OK, that means no big changes for them. OK, they might have to make some small tweaks to how they do business or pay a fine, but they can keep operating pretty much as they are now. So a slap on the wrist, but no major surgery. And what about the worst case? The worst case for Google is that a court forces them to break up the company, kind of like what happened to AT&T. Oh, wow. That would mean selling off big parts of their business like Chrome, Android, maybe even YouTube. It would totally shake up the entire tech industry. I can't even imagine what the Internet would look like if Google was broken up into little pieces. So what's going to determine what happens? A few things. How strong is the DOJ's case? Can they actually prove that Google broke the law? OK. Second, how will Google defend itself? Will their lawyers be able to fight back? And finally, what's the mood like around this issue? Do people actually want the government to go after big tech? All of that matters. It's a mix of legal arguments, corporate strategy, and public opinion. It's not over yet, that's for sure. Definitely not. And there's another question we haven't touched on yet. Even if Google is broken up, does that fix the problem? Or do we just end up with different tech giants becoming the new monopolies? It's like you knock one down and another one pops right up. How do we stop that cycle? That's a real concern and something that policymakers need to think about. Breaking up one company might not address the underlying cause of concentrated power in tech. Right. We need to think bigger, more creatively, this case could be what finally gets those conversations going. So what are those solutions? How do we stop these monopolies from happening over and over again? It's a tough question, and there's no simple answer. It'll take a lot of different things. Stronger antitrust laws, 
more regulation, and maybe even new ways of thinking about ownership and control in the tech world. So we need some new ideas, not just in technology, but in how we govern it. Exactly. We're in uncharted territory here. The decisions we make now will shape the internet for generations to come. What's grabbing your attention in all of this? I think it's how much we rely on the internet without really thinking about it. We just assume it'll always be there, connecting us, giving us information. But this case shows how fragile that all is and how easily it can be controlled or manipulated. It's a wake-up call, you know? That's such an important point. The internet isn't neutral. It reflects the values and power structures of the people who built it and the people who use it. As the internet changes, we have to be conscious about shaping those values and structures to make sure it works for us, not the other way around. That's a great point. We've talked about the legal fight, the consequences, the big questions about power and control in the digital world. What are your final thoughts before we wrap up this part of our conversation? Okay, so we've covered the legal stuff and the impact this could have globally. Now I want to talk about like the bigger picture, the societal questions this brings up. Right. It really does feel like it goes way beyond just Google, you know? Totally. This case is about power. Who has it? Who controls the internet and what that means for all of us? Think about it. Yeah. We rely on the internet for almost everything these days to talk to each other, get information, watch movies, even for essential services. Right, right. When just a few companies have so much power over something this important, it makes you think about, like, what kind of world we're building. It raises questions about democracy, freedom of speech, you know, big stuff. Those are some big questions. Can you break that down a little more? What are the specific concerns? So one concern is something called algorithmic bias. These are the algorithms that control everything online, like search engines, social media. They can actually, without meaning to, reinforce existing biases and inequalities. So it's like these algorithms are making decisions that affect our lives, but not always in a fair way. Exactly. And when a few powerful companies control those algorithms, it means a small group of people have a huge influence over what we see, what we read, even what we think about. That's kind of scary. What can we do about that? That's the challenge. And it's not just about bias. It's about censorship, too. When companies like Google can decide to silence someone or prevent certain viewpoints from being seen, it raises questions about free speech online. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? Yeah. We want to protect free speech, but we also don't want these platforms to be used to spread hate or lies or incite violence. How do you find that balance? It's a huge question right now, one of the hardest ones we're facing. How do we protect free speech and also make sure these online spaces are responsible? There's no easy solution. It's probably going to take new technology, new laws, and honestly, just people changing how they behave online. This case really shows how much we rely on the internet and maybe how little we understand how it works. We just expect it to be there connecting us, giving us information. But this whole thing with Google shows how fragile it all is and how easily it can be messed with. I think you're right. It's a wake-up call. The internet isn't just some neutral tool, you know? It's a reflection of the values and the power structures of the societies that created it. As the internet keeps changing, we have to be more proactive about shaping those values, making sure it benefits us, not the other way around. That's a good way to put it. Okay, so besides bias and censorship, what other societal impacts should we keep in mind? One thing that often gets overlooked is the impact on innovation. When a few companies control everything, it can actually stifle creativity and prevent new companies from starting up. This is especially true in the tech world, where it's already hard for newcomers to break in. Are you saying that Google being so dominant could actually slow down progress? That seems kind of backward. Yeah, I know it sounds weird, but history shows us that monopolies often get comfortable and resist change. They don't have a reason to innovate because they're already winning. They're already at the top. Why climb higher? But isn't Google supposed to be innovative? They always have new stuff coming out. True. But imagine how much more innovation we'd see if there was more competition. If Google had to worry about other companies catching up, they'd be even more motivated to push boundaries and come up with game-changing ideas. So this isn't just about breaking up one big company. It's about creating a system where there's more innovation, a more dynamic online world. Exactly. It's about making sure the internet is a place where new ideas can thrive where the next generation of inventors and creators have a chance to make their mark. This has been a really eye-opening conversation. It's made me think about how all these different things are connected, you know, technology, the economy, politics, even philosophy. 
This is about so much more than just Google's future. Absolutely. It's a reminder that technology is never neutral. The choices we make as individuals and as a society shape how it develops, and those choices have huge consequences for the kind of future we build. That's a perfect way to put it. What's the one thing you hope our listeners take away from all of this? I hope they understand that this case is a turning point, not just for Google, but for the internet as a whole. What happens next will determine how we regulate these powerful tech companies, how we balance competing interests in the digital world, and ultimately, what kind of online world we want to live in. It's a future that we all have a hand in shaping. I couldn't agree more. Well, that brings our deep dive to a close. I hope you found this as insightful as I did. We've covered a lot, but there's always more to explore. Stay curious, stay informed, and keep asking those tough questions. Until next time.